Hey everyone, hope you're having a good time at FOSDEM this year. I'm Ryan Hodek, and I am here to talk about the FEX MU project. Providing, hopefully, faster x86 emulation for ARCH64, or as most people know it as, 64-bit ARM. Alright, so first of all, who I'm, am I and why should you care? Some history on me. In 2008, I started working on the Dolphin emulator project when it went open source. Dolphin is a Nintendo GameCube and Wii console emulator, also sometimes a Triforce arcade cabinet emulator depending on its mood. There's a lot of history here, but I only had a Panda board, so I wrote an ARM v7 JIT compiler for accelerating the CPU emulation, then continued on to add a 64-bit ARM JIT. And now people can load Dolphin on their Android or ARM Linux devices and run a significant portion of the game's full speed today. After just under 10 years of that, I then spent a few years porting console games to Android. Good luck finding any of them. You may be able to spy my name in the credits. After that adventure, I started working on FEX in early 2019. We're a fairly young project, but we're rapidly improving. So what is FEX? It's a user space only emulator that translates both 32-bit x86 and x86-64 to ARCH64. This has the quirk that 32-bit applications will appear to be a 64-bit application to the Linux kernel. We only do Linux on Linux translation at the moment, although hooking up to some level of wine is not out of the question. The major driving goal behind FEX is that we need to be fast enough to run a wide variety of applications. Of particular interest is full speed backwards compatibility with x86 games. Last I looked, there's something around 65,000 games on the Steam platform alone. And barring any video driver compatibility problems, it would be nice to have greater than 90% compatibility with these games. We use a CPU emulation technique called a JIT compiler to get performance we need for the compatibility layer. We'll come back later to explain this. FEX is under very active development and is very quickly smoothing out a bunch of the rough edges it has. Additionally, the project is licensed under the MIT code license to grant it compatibility with as many projects as possible. What is FEX not trying to be? We will not be emulating the x86 secure modes. This has some very large design goal changes by omitting this problem entirely. By not emulating any of the kernel or hypervisor level features, we gain a lot of performance for free. For example, we don't need to worry about an application jumping to the kernel and then messing with memory mappings in weird ways or other edge case OS features. To our detriment, we will never be able to boot the Linux kernel inside of our emulator. In that same vein, we are not a hardware reference emulator or platform. We're not expecting anyone to bring up any new features or instructions and side effects. Both of these problem spaces are better served by a project like QEMU, which supports pretty much every x86 instruction set extension. FEX also isn't planning on supporting any older x86 modes like 16-bit mode or virtual 8086 mode. Other projects like DOSBox already have this space covered pretty well, and it is better to support those modes over there. Another huge problem is 100% accuracy to a single piece of hardware. There's enough wiggle room in the x86 spec that being accurate to any piece of hardware in the wild doesn't actually matter. This sort of thing includes undefined behavior of flags on instructions, undefined edge cases in some instructions, that differ even between AMD and Intel hardware, and then floating point accuracy requirements. So long as we get close enough to the requirements of the spec without sacrificing performance, that's what we're going for. And that's not to say that we're forgoing accuracy altogether. We have many unit tests to ensure that our CPU emulation is close enough to the x86 spec. So let's do a shout out to some of the other projects in the space. QMU user is the big one on Linux. QMU is something that most everyone knows. It supports everything on everything. Not great for gaming, though. 
Box 86 and Box 64. Our two projects very similar to FEX in design and also started around the same time. True to their name, Box 86 translates to 32-bit ARM and Box 64 translates to 64-bit ARM. There are also a user space only emulator that uses a JIT compiler for emulation. They are showing great performance and are very interesting projects. In the closed source space, we have some interesting project products as well. Apple has their Rosetta 2 software, which translates x86-64 to ARCH64, only available on macOS. Microsoft has their XTA translation layer, which stands for x86 to ARM. It translates both x86 and x86-64 to ARM, only for Windows. Both of these products are showing the strength of user mode emulation in their respective ecosystems. Additionally, LTEX Exigear is fairly popular among Android users. It's a closed source emulator that runs on both Linux and Android. I don't know much about it, but it seems like Huawei has been shipping it. Then we have Intel's Houdini compatibility layer. This goes in the opposite direction, running ARM code on x86 devices. This is used on x86 Android phones, Chrome OS, and the new Android on Windows feature that Microsoft is shipping. And FEX has a few large interesting problems. In particular, the x86 instruction set is massive and it doesn't map perfectly to ARM. Passing through all of the kernel syscalls is time consuming to get correct. And there can be subtle differences between the syscall interface and what glibc provides, and maybe even minor behavior changes between different architectures. Uh, signals and exception handling kind of fall into the same problem space. On both signals and exceptions, we need to do some form of state reconstruction to give the application a valid state when one of these things occur. For example, the mono runtime uses signals to do garbage collection. This needs a correct enough stack register that it can know when to invalidate objects and the mono JIT will crash if it's not correct. Some games also use exceptions to page in contents of files. This is a classic 32-bit application technique when you're in a RAM constrained environment. The signal's memory address needs to be correct so a game knows what file's contents to page in. The CPU emulation is where most of the work goes in the project. It's definitely my favorite part of FX, since there's just so much to do in it. The x86-64 instruction set, again, is massive, which has dissuaded a bunch of emulator developers' attempts at tackling it. FX today supports up to SSE 4.1, with SSE 4.2 and AVX coming up soon. This level of support is required since the latest AAA games are starting to target these latest features. We can thank the latest game consoles for this. Even without supporting every instruction extension, the number of valid instructions in our decode tables total to just under 1,400. We have about 245 unique handlers for these encodings, which is an impressive number even accounting for the duplication that occurs due to a lot of the instruction operating sizes. I've mentioned JITs a couple of times now, and for the uninitiated, I'll give a, a quick explanation. A just-in-time compiler is a program that translates some program code to instructions for the host CPU. The main difference between a traditional compiler and a JIT compiler is that the translation occurs at runtime, thus just-in-time. Coming from a world of console emulators, most of the emulators there only need fairly basic JITs. I'm not sure if there is a correct terminology here, but I tend to call these simpler console JITs either one-to-one -one JITs or non-optimizing JITs. These JITs will typically start by reading instructions directly and then emit host code from those the code that was read. No steps in between. This means that you typically lose optimizations that happen when parsing badly optimized code or code that doesn't directly map to the CPU you're translating to. 
you just don't have the visibility for future instructions that are incoming. An advantage to this basic JIT is that they are very fast at JITting or emitting code, and you're less likely to get stuttering while gaming. Since FEX is needing all of the CPU performance possible, we are running an IR-based JIT, which is more similar to what web browsers and offline compilers do these days. An advantage that we have with our JIT is that we're only targeting one host architecture. This means that our IR almost maps perfectly to 64-bit ARM instructions, which is about as optimal as you can get with an IR JIT. So here's a small example of the ASM translation steps that our assembly unit tests target. On the top left, we have four x86 instructions color-coded so we can track it through the steps. All this does is load two vector registers, does an integer packed vector addition, and then does an x86 halt instruction, which just raises a seg fault for our testing infrastructure. We first optimize x86 instructions to an IR. We do some optimization passes on that IR, and then we emit ARM code at that point. The optimization step is very necessary for FEX, since we're planning to run games that require recent x86 processors to run full speed. You can see that the basic instructions in this example map fairly well, but there is a bit of state tracking overhead and we aren't quite generating optimal code, and tracking the amount of code blowup is a good case for figuring out why some code just performs worse than expected. So one of the problems with our IR JIT based approach is that it just takes more time to JIT code than a non-optimizing JIT. Almost all of our JIT time is dominated by our optimization passes and register allocation, which is a hard problem to solve. To help combat this problem, we're adding multiple levels of caching. Some of the code is upstream and, or actively in progress. The first tier of caching is that we'll cache the IR to drive, which removes the time it takes to translate x86 to an IR, including all of the optimization passes time. It is very quick to convert our IR into ARCH64 assembly, since as said before, it maps pretty much one-to-one. -one. Additionally, we are working on caching JIT code to the drive as well. This removes almost all of the JIT time and instead just involves copying the code from the file doing some code relocations, and then just executing. Caching at these multiple levels is fairly complex, but it has some hidden benefits than just removing JIT time from one running application. Since FEX tracks shared libraries loaded into memory, our IR and code caching is cached depending on the library in question being loaded. So something loading OpenGL will add uh, data to the cache, and another application also loading OpenGL will benefit from more cached code being saved. This means the more applications sharing code will benefit every application rather than just that one, improving performance for all new applications. This also significantly reduces the amount of memory overhead that FEX uses, since FEX is a little bit of a memory hog at the moment. A tricky thing that I mentioned earlier is that we convert every application into a 64-bit process, both 32-bit x86 and x86-64 translate into an ARCH64 process. For 32-bit applications, we lie to the application as much as possible, so it thinks it is running a true 32-bit process. This gets particularly complex around memory allocations and some Linux syscalls. To combat the memory allocation problems, we currently spend CPU time on FEX startup of the application to completely consume the full 64-bit address space. This means that any 32-bit application will end up consuming up to 128 terabytes of virtual address space. FEX then uses its own memory allocator to only allocate in the 64-bit memory space 
leaving the full 32-bit memory space for the guest process. Ideally, FEX would get some kernel support to avoid this allocation problem, but upstream isn't very amicable to the proposals, sadly. A significant performance improvement in FEX is the ability to remove CPU emulation overhead with thunking. Thunking is a process in which we can capture an app when an application loads a shared library, and if possible, we replace that library with an ARM version. We are able to capture any entry point into that shared library and then redirect it to the host native library. This results in an absolutely incredible amount of speedup that is hard to get with, with direct CPU emulation. Currently, we don't have a large number of thunked libraries. We have OpenGL, Vulkan, and X11 libraries, and a couple of miscellaneous ones, and we're currently working on improving this. 32-bit thunking comes with its own challenges that we haven't tackled yet, but it's expected to be working this year. As a side note, one of the major things that made us choose to translate everything to a 64-bit ARM process is that the ARM company itself is very swiftly going to be killing off its 32-bit support in their hardware. There's already hardware shipping today with 32-bit support getting removed, including the Cortex-X2, the Cortex-A510, and Apple's latest CPUs. Linux syscall wrapping has some fun problems that need to be solved. A large portion of the syscalls can be directly passed to the host kernel, but the ones that we can't pass through directly can really cause some headaches. This is particularly difficult with 32-bit syscalls when we're translating. Some syscalls like get dense and robust futexes just can't accurately be emulated in user space. Something like these currently just fall over and need kernel assistance to work. Luckily, games don't typically need these, so we haven't been bitten with that problem yet. For 32-bit applications, we also need additional fix-ups. IOCTLs are the biggest area we need to fix up here, where we need to know every IOCTL interface and translate it to the 64-bit interface. We support a significant number of IOCTLs that games need, but it's unlikely to ever get 100% coverage. If we're missing an IOCTL that your application needs, then let us know and we can work on adding it. More of the problems are described on FEX's GitHub wiki page. You can find the link in the slide deck. So hardware assisted emulation. ARM hardware has a bunch of extensions coming to the CPUs that improve x86 emulation. LSE and LSE2 extensions improve Atomics and Unaligned Atomics. The RNG extension lets us emulate x86's random number generation instruction. The RCPC extension can improve non-atomic memory accesses. Uh, the TME extension would let us emulate unaligned atomics that the LSE2 extension doesn't cover like split locks from the Intel architecture that some applications accidentally rely on. And the two SVE extensions allow us to emulate AVX more efficiently as long as we can get a 256-bit register size. The floating point alternative round mode extension would let us emulate some edge case SSE behavior. And another edge case feature is the float exceptions for games that actually rely on that feature. Only Apple hardware supports that currently. The one gigahertz virtual cycle counter is an improvement over most SOCs, only providing a 19 to 24 megahertz counter. There are some games that do some timing based off this counter and don't run full speed if it's too slow. Kind of a weird edge case. And fun enough, ARM just recently added some memory copy instructions which could be useful for some x86 repeating instructions as well. For a feature that ARM doesn't currently have in the spec is a strong memory model which matches the x86 model. The only CPU that currently does this is Apple's, which they explicitly added for Rosetta. A lot of performance is lost just to emulating this memory model correctly, and if Cortex added support for this, then FEX would immediately gain a significant performance improvement. 
the performance improvement here just can't be understated. So how do we ensure all of this is correct? Continuous integration testing is a huge piece behind FEX staying accurate. One of the biggest pieces is the handwritten assembly tests that test each of our instruction implementations. FEX currently has around 1,200 handwritten assembly tests, which will test basic instruction usage and edge cases that we've hit. We also have some basic handwritten IR tests, which stresses some behavior in our IR. These aren't super extensive though, because most edge cases can be hit with our assembly tests. Uh, we also bring in some other applications unit testing that can extend some of our coverage. Since our unit tests only really cover CPU emulation, we need more testing for the other components. GCC's test suite is mostly CPU emulation related, but it can hit some things that we don't test for. And the POSIX and GVisor tests are more extensively testing the Linux interface for FEX. These are quite extensive interface tests and FEX doesn't yet pass all of them. These are super handy to have, even if some of them have race conditions, making them a bit flaky. Also, we have some basic C++ tests for internal API testing, just to make sure we don't break those. And all of these unit tests are run for every merge request and every merge into main to make sure we don't regress anything. Currently, each of our build machines take anywhere from three to eight minutes to run all of these. Some future endeavors. The work on FEX is never really ending, but we do have some goals for this year. We want better and faster code generation just to make the compatibility layer better. We want to improve our instruction fuzzing infrastructure. We have a start of this, but it was never really wired up. And I'm going to be more aggressively targeting C more CI once Ampere SIR and servers start shipping. This should allow us to scale up our CR CI even more than what we currently have. Library thunking this year is also going to be an even larger focus. The more system libraries we don't have to emulate, the faster we go. Self-modifying code support needs to be wired up this year. This way we can properly support things like Mono, Java, Chrome, and other applications with JITs built into them. And a big one is that FEX MU needs to play nicely with Steam Proton and pressure vessel since we are targeting games specifically. This requires patching pressure vessel upstream to understand running in an emulated environment with multi-arch support. This will take a bit of time, but it shouldn't be too hard to wire up since it is open source. And now a demo video. This is a pre-recorded set of games running on some ARM hardware, and it's pre-recorded to make sure nothing breaks. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. Hello, and again, welcome to the Aperture Science Computer Aided Enrichment Center.
kid uh, wants another balloon animal. Ah, jeez. What now? Do you have any more dead worms back there? Well, sure. Some exciting stuff in that demo, and there's only more to come. And with that said, here's where to find Fex. We already have some users hammering away on it, and I hope you'll take a look at Fex and find some use cases for it. I want to thank all the people that have contributed to Fex so far. Without their continued support, this project would just would not have been possible. And that's the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. See ya.